This week I am, uh, which is typical for what I do, <laughs> this week I received some criticism. I received some criticism because of my not recognizing the ordination of women. So, I felt led to turn this criticism into a teaching opportunity for us this morning on what the Torah teaches and reflects God's perfect purpose for women, specifically in a congregational setting. Now, this morning, referencing specifically from our Brich HaDashah portion, you may want to have your Bibles ready and open to the two letters from Rabbi Shaul to Timothy, First and Second Timothy, in particular, 1 Timothy, chapter 2, and verses 9 through 15. That's where we're going to spend a lot of time. Timothy, to kind of give you a little context, Timothy has been leading this congregation in Ephesus in Asia Minor, which would be modern Turkey today. Ephesus had a great Messianic synagogue, but had fallen into doctrinal error and ungodly living. Now, Rabbi Shaul has entrusted Timothy with a task, the task of attempting to straighten out this mess, to teach the people there how to behave themselves in the Beit El. And what is that? The house of God. And among several problems in this congregation was a problem related to the women there. See, there were certain women attending this synagogue who were usurping the authoritative roles of men by posturing themselves as teachers. Along with them, there were also other women who were coming to services dressed inappropriately. And that's something we had discussed at length a few Shabbats back. And so in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 9 to 15, Rabbi Shaul addresses the matter of how the women of the congregation are to function and serve there. The subject, needless to say, is very germane in our society today. Now, the modern destruction of God's perfect purpose for women has been tragic. Yes, there is a war on women today, you hear in the political environment, but the war is not from the Republicans. The war is from society. The role and function of women today, and consequently their divine define design and their ultimate well-being in life, their meaning and sense of satisfaction is being continually attacked and perverted. Women are being told to be bold, to be assertive, to be confronted, to be independent, to be competitive, to take leadership, exert authority, to be the breadwinner, rise to the same function level as men and not take a back seat to anything in that regard. And a lot of women today are going, rah, rah, yeah. And sadly and tragically, there are churches, there are synagogues, there are Messian synagogues, colleges and seminaries that have bought into this even though the Torah is absolutely clear on the matter. Women are being cast into roles which God had never intended for them to be a part of. I was thinking this week that if I could identify one single attitude biblically that would be the supreme attitude of attitudes, the most desirable attitude of all from God's point of view would have to be humility. And if we were to identify together one activity that would be the most desirable it would probably be the activity of service. 
So by combining the two, humility and service, I would say this, that the Bible teaches us that a woman's loftiest goals are found in the humble service that God has designed her for under the direction and protection of men. And when that is perverted, brothers and sisters, I can tell you for sure, chaos results. It results in society, and it results in the kehilat, in the congregation. We've seen it over and over, and it's more, we're more sensitive to it. Daniel, can you bring me back down just a skosh? And we've seen it especially, you see it more in smaller congregations because we're more intimately involved in each other's lives. Unlike a congregation of 1,000 or 2,000, they don't have a clue what's going on out there. Now, this is something that we are dealing with in our society, but it is not something that, our, that only our society has faced. The issues that Timothy's congregation was facing with women were quite similar. In Rabbi Shaul's second letter to Timothy, they are in, described women as weak-willed women who are heaped with sins and swayed by various impulses. And not only were some women living in, in an ungodly and impure way, but there were women who were usurping the role of men in the congregation. And so in our Bruch HaDashah portion, Rabbi Shaul, the Apostle Paul, is guiding Timothy in Torah. He's guiding him in Torah on how to confront the women in his congregation with those two issues. So what we pick up from our portion is that Shaul is very, very concerned as he should be, and as we all should be, in consistency. Consistency in a woman's testimony, as well as consistency in a man's testimony. Less concerned about her appearance, a woman, and I'm quoting from Scripture, should instead adorn themselves with what is appropriate for women who claim to be worshiping God, namely, good deeds. Now, a question both men and women should always be asking themselves. Is my witness consistent with what I have publicly professed? Is my witness consistent with my public declaration of Yeshua as my Lord and Savior? What, if anything, am I really communicating, whether it's verbally or non-verbally, in my witness? Now, when we claim to be observant followers of Yeshua, we are claiming to reverence God. You are claiming to worship God. You are claiming to honor God. You are claiming to be faithful to God. You are claiming to obey God, to adore God, to serve God. On and on I can go. Any woman who claims to serve God, and love, and worship, and honor, and adore God should conduct herself in such a way that her good works support that profession. And yet, not much different from Timothy days, there are those women who are determined to preach, determined to teach, and thereby undermine the authority of the rabbi and his leadership. They strive to be recognized equally with men. They want to be ordained as elders. And the problem with that is, and hear me, that a woman who on one hand professes godliness, professes godliness and reverence for God, cannot on the other hand say, therefore, I want to violate what God says. I want to change what God says in his word. I want to adapt God's word to my will and desire. And so when I see a woman, and we see a lot of it today, who wants to step out of God's design plan for her within the body in order to serve God, I see that as nothing more than a contradiction. Yep. If not a fully hypocrisy. If a woman professes godliness, then she should conduct herself in her attitude, in her adornment, and in her activity in a way that is consistent with what she is declaring and professing as a believer. The Torah is so clear on this 
that I don't have a clue how anyone with an open mind can come to the Word of God and conclude any differently about the biblical role of a woman. But today, we become fashionable in the church. Now, the first thing the Rabbi Shaul says regarding the role of a woman is this. Let the women learn. Now, you have to understand there's a lot more there than just let the women learn. Let the women learn. Is he saying it that way? No. The Greek tells us something different. The Greek word here is manthano, and if you've had the, uh, the joy of taking Greek as I have, you know that it is replete with endings and tenses and verbs and voices and <laughs> partisan Greek is crazy. But Greek is a very specific language, and in this case, manthano is in the present active imperative. Imperative, just like it sounds. It's a command. So you can imagine Rabbi Shalul why the vision is being a very strong personality, looking at the congregation, let the women learn. That's how I'm seeing it. Let them learn. And I'm sure there's a lot of men going, what? And I'll explain that. That word, manthano, is a word from which, in the Greek, disciple comes from. Let the women be disciple. Teach the women. Let them be involved in the learning process. Don't send them all out to get the oneg ready. Don't send them into the nursery or into the toddler room. Let the women learn! They were to be included in every learning opportunity. Amen? Amen? Now, you're probably thinking, at least in our day, well, isn't that like pretty obvious? Well, no. maybe it's obvious to us, but apparently it wasn't that obvious to them. Remember at that time, and it's important to get your head around this, because we even see remnants of that today in Orthodox Judaism. That in that time, rabbinical, and let me make that declaration, rabbinical Jewish tradition had expressed a very low esteem for women. Jewish men, frankly, did not feel that women needed to be part of the learning process. Not that they were forbidden to come to the synagogue. No, they, many would attend, but to the men it was irrelevant if they learned anything. They could listen, just keep their mouth shut. That's basically the attitude. But it was a little concerned whether they learned anything at all. What the congregation of Ephesus experienced was a retaliation by the women. They rose up. They rebelled to this treatment. And according to chapter 2, in 1 Timothy verse 12, certain women were teaching and taking authority over men, which prompted Rabbi Shaul to instruct Timothy to make him stop. You're running the congregation now, you're a big boy. Take them in. Make those women stop. And the issue for Rabbi Shaul was not that they were learning, it was their assuming a role as a teacher from what they were learning. The women must be taught, they must be dis discipled, they must learn God's truth. It is essential to their spiritual life and it is essential to their role. In the plan of God. And let me be very, very clear here. Because a lot of people read into the words when you have discussions about roles of men and roles of women. We don't need to read into anything. I'm very clear about what I'm saying. And one thing is very, very clear that God demands equality of the sexes in spiritual life and spiritual blessing. So in spite of rabbinical tradition, there is no suppression of women in regards to spiritual matters that can be found in Torah. Men and women share an equal position of spiritual life and blessing. For example, in Shemot, Exodus chapter 19 and 20, the Torah is given to whom? Humankind. Well, I believe that includes men and women. And he promised to both men and women that they, what, if they obeyed Torah, they were what? Blessed. And if you disobeyed Torah, you were cursed. And is that men or women anywhere in there? No. no. It's men and women. 
humankind. Hashem established from the very beginning both men and women are responsible. That's why you have a bar mitzvah. Both of them come of age. And at the time you become son or daughter of the commandments, you are now accountable to Hashem for your choices. It's not on your parents anymore, it's on you. No, you know, no more juvenile detention or whatever. You know? <laughs> it's jail. <laughs> you know, um, you, you pay the penalty, you pay the fine, you're accountable. Amen? And so, he establishes Hashem from the very beginning that both men and women are going to be responsible for their spiritual life and their obedience to God. So, we read in Devarim 6 or Deuteronomy, Shema Israel, right? We just did this morning. Shema Israel, the Lord our God is one to all <laughs> men and women. And the Bahavta, well, these words are for all and to be taught to whom? To the children. It doesn't say boy children or girl children, it says children. Now, from my understanding of all, that would be both men and women, boys and girls. And further, the consequences for disobeying the commands were given equally for all people, men or women. Both men and women, did you know, could take a Nazarite vow. You could be a Nazir. That's right. The high levels of spiritual commitment were in no way disrestricted to men. In the Torah, men and women, brothers and sisters, are of equal value. Men and women share equal spiritual privilege, and men and women share equal spiritual responsibility. And just as Hashem had been with men, He also had been very intimate, <clears throat> very personal, very glorious in His miraculous appearances to women as well, as He had with men. We always think about God appearing to the men, well, what about to the women? For example, in Genesis 3.13 and following, he appears to whom? Chava, or Eve. In Genesis 16, who does he appear to? Hagar. In Genesis 18, in Rashid 18, who does he appear to? Sarah, the wife of Abraham. And into the Haftar in Judges 13.3, he appears to the mother of Samson, or Samson. And not only that, men and women both serve God in very special ways. From our Torah portion, in particular this morning, it says that women served at the entrance to the Mishkan of the tabernacle. I'm not sure what they did, but that's where they were. And the choir is described in Nehemiah or Nehemiah chapter 7, verse 67, that's made up of 245 singing men and singing women. Men and women served Hashem in the Tanakh equally. But, here's where you've got to listen to me very, very carefully. This does not mean that men and women share the same roles. For example, who can tell me how many women kings are listed in the kings of Israel? How many women kings were listed in the kings of Judah? How many women priests are found in Tanakh? How many women authored books of the Bible? 66 books. How many women authored them? None? No, Esther and, and Ruth are books about women, but they weren't authored by women. There are no women in the entire Tanakh who held an ongoing prophetic ministry. Here's where it's going to get a little dicey for you, right? Because I know what you're thinking. The moment I said that, you were thinking. Right? Ooh, Rabbi's going there. I am going there. As long as there's a word of God, I'm going there. If you don't want me to go to the word of God, there's other places. You like to water it down. Those who advocate for women pastors, preachers, teachers, and evangelists will want to say, well, wait a minute, Rabbi, all haughty. Let me tell you about all these women mentioned as prophetesses in the Old Testament. Well, let's take a look at them. Let's do that, right? Want to do it? Okay. There, actually, there are five. There are five. I'm going to describe them to you. First woman 
described in the Torah and listed as a prophetess is Miriam. In Shemot or Exodus chapter 15, verse 20, she's the sister of Moshe, and she's called a prophetess only, only because she on one occasion led the women of Israel dance, during which, while she was dancing, God gave her a revelation to speak. She, God gave her a word to speak out. One time. Other than that one word, she had no ongoing prophetic ministry. That's where it ended for Miriam. Let's try the second one. The second one, the second of the five, which is most often referenced, Deborah, who in Judges chapter 4 is also called a prophetess only because, only because she was used by God to give a direct revelation to a man, man named Barak. And that Barak needs another revelation. <laughs> <coughs> She gave that direct revelation on that unique occasion on the battle that was going on and thus at that moment in time she was used by God prophetically. Otherwise, from that point on, there is no other occasion of her engaging in any kind of ongoing prophetic work. Let's look at the third woman mentioned as a prophetess. Her name is Huldah. And she's mentioned twice, both in 2 Kings 22, 14, and 2 Chronicles 34, verse 22. And she is called the prophetess only because she was given a revelation from God, again, the same story, for Hilkiah, the priest, about the coming judgment on Jerusalem and on Yehuda. And guess what? Just like the others, we know of no other occasion where she continued in the prophetic office. That was it, her one shot. Let's look at the fourth woman. The fourth woman, called a prophetess, is a woman named Nodiah, who is mentioned in Nehemiah, or Nehemiah chapter 6, verse 14, and she's also identified not only as a prophetess, but as a false prophetess. A false prophet. And she, like a false prophet like so many that exist today. <coughs> the fifth one mentioned is the wife of Yeshiahu or Isaiah in chapter 8 of the said book. Only because she gave birth to a child whose name had a prophetic Meaning, she never spoke a prophecy. She simply gave birth to a child whose name had a prophetic meaning. So now you can see from that illustration of the wife of Yeshiahu that the word prophetess was used in a really a general way. So of the five women that are referred to as prophetess, one is a prophetess simply because she gave birth to a child whose name had a prophetic meaning. Another is a false prophet. And the remaining three are called prophetess because on one occasion, one occasion, they spoke a word from God. And that was it. That's all. So what does that tell us? It tells us, though there were no women kings, no women priests, no women authors of scripture, no women prophets. Still, women nevertheless were used by God in many, many areas. That's right. It's in the Brich Hadashah, the New Testament specifically, Galatians 3, verse 28, where people who advocate for women ordination and women elders and women preachers and all that like to go to attempt to make their point. There it is. Galatians has to be the most misunderstood book in all of Scripture. For sure. And misappropriated. And I will read it for you. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free man, neither male nor female, for in union with the Messiah Yeshua, you are all one. We are all one in Messiah. Who has a problem with that? Nobody. Nobody really has a problem with that. We are all one in Messiah. Amen? Amen. 
That's right. But like I've told you so many times, part of the benefits of my cemetery education, the mocking I often re receive from my leadership, <laughs> but one of the benefits of that education is they teach you one principal point and when you are uh, unpacking scripture and that is context, context, context That's right. context, context, context we have to look at the context which reveals the discussion is not about the roles of men and women. The context of that verse is about redemption. The whole passage before and after is talking about the wonderful reality of salvation in Messiah Yeshua, which is available to all people, Jew, Gentile, bond, free, male, female. That's all that it's talking about there. <clears throat> it has nothing to do with the role of women in the congregation. That's right. Nothing. And so it's ludicrous and a ludicrous distortion of Scripture to try and take that passage and advocate that roles are equal when it's not even talking about roles. To make that point, you're taking Scripture totally out of context. And that again reveals the ignorance of so many people who go to the Word of God who had no business to. We've talked about that. So as in the Tanakh, in the Brich Hadashah, there are no women rabbis or pastors, no women elders, no women evangelists, no women prophets. And some will point out, oh yeah, well how about this? How about the four daughters of Philip in Acts 21.9 who did prophesy? Well, what it doesn't say or imply is that they were prophets, nor were they evangelists, nor were they missionaries, nor were they elders, nor were they rabbis. All they did, like the other prophetesses, was give a prophetic word one time. No different than Miriam, the mother of Yeshua, <clears throat> who spoke prophetically after she received the word of God. In 1 Corinthians 11, 5, it says, A woman who prays or prophesies should have her head covered. A woman who prays or prophesies should have her head covered. And yes, there were times and there were places for women to pray to speak a word from God. It says in Acts 2.17 that in the latter times, quoting from Yoel, that your daughters will prophesy. There it is. And there are times and places, like I said, where women will speak the word of God, but doing so doesn't suddenly make you into the role of a rabbi, or a pastor, or a teacher, or an evangelist, or an apostle. How often do we see in certain communities, well, that's, that's apostle so-and-so, and it's a woman. Well, where do you find that biblically? You find these things in church traditions, but you don't find them biblically. Nowhere. We are adding to, if not deleting from, Scripture. And you know what the scripture says about that, to not do it. And anybody who does that is least in the kingdom. Women do have different roles. Does that mean that they were inadequate spiritually? Not at all. Nobody's saying that. Think about it. <clears throat> the men that are called to lead, what are they a product of? <laughs> Women. <laughs> right? I think I told this story once before when, when I was licensed with the International Church of the Four Square Gospel. And in order to apply for that licensing to come on board, I had to answer a series of questions of, you know, that pertain to their bylaws. And one of the questions was, what, what, is, what is your uh, biblical understanding of women's role in ministry? <laughs> and... Uh, I used the example of the founder of Foursquare, Amy Semple McPherson. I knew it was dead meat, but they still licensed me. But uh, I used the, the example of Amy Semple McPherson, who left her husband, <laughs> left her husband to basically find the Foursquare church or gospel, and then got remarried, and had a son. Well, at 
actually know that I, that I didn't get married. She got remarried, but when she was previously married and left her husband, she had a son, Rolf McPherson. Okay? And so I argued in, in that question that actually, probably, if she, her role would have been more biblically accurate if she had stayed at home and raised up Rolf McPherson to start Foursquare and to lead it, which he ultimately did when his mother passed on. So that was his destiny, but she should have raised him up firsthand rather than leading herself because her life ended up being a train wreck. Scandals and getting in trouble. But you know, you don't say that in Foursquare because you know she's idolized. No different than like Ellen White is in uh, Seventh day events. Men are product of women, not only physically, but in terms of their character development. They are, we are strong men. We are strongly influenced by the women in our lives, in many ways, our mother. Timothy, who learned at the feet of his mother and grandmother, is a product himself of a woman who learned the Word of God, who learned the Torah, and spoke it into his life. But that is very much different than taking on the role intended for men in the Kehillah. In no sense should be confused, construed that a woman is a second-class citizen. Nowhere are you hearing that this morning, because she is no way portrayed as that scripturally. For example, the first person that Yeshua exposed his messiahship to was what? A woman. Not just a woman. Do you remember who it was? She was a wicked woman. She had a whole bunch of husbands and was living in adultery. It's living in sin when you're not married. <laughs> it was that woman of Samaria he met at the well of Sakhar that he brought the wonderful truth of who he was, and I believe brought her salvation. In Luke 13 and Mark 5, Yeshua healed women. He had just as much compassion on them as he did on men. He was just as concerned to heal them as he was men. In Luke 10, 38 to 42, Yeshua taught who? Women. In return, he was ministered to by women. It says in Luke 8, verse 3, that a whole group of women surrounded him and offered their care and support and sustenance. But at no time did any of those women preach to him, teach to him, or anybody else for that matter. They had a role. They had a role there, but the role was distinct from Yeshua's and the twelve. And when Yeshua arose from the dead, whom did he first appear to? A woman. And they didn't believe her. He first appeared to a woman. And Yeshua called for a woman to be evangelized. He said to his men, his Talmudim, do this. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Well, every creature includes women. The fruit of the spirit of Galatians 5 is for whom? Men and women. Right? And when Rabbi Shaul lists in Romans 16 all the people who helped him in his ministry, guess what? Look at the list. It's full of women. It's full of women. So you see, brothers and sisters, women have a very, very important place in the economy of God, and they are on an equal level with men in terms of spiritual life. But they are not equal in each other's roles because they are unique and distinct. Now, that's why he says, let the women learn. They have to learn. They have to learn this truth as well. It isn't enough for us men just to tell them that. They have to learn it for themselves, as we have to learn our roles for ourselves. Men have to learn that our lives are to be laid down and sacrificial for our families. Women have to learn why. Oh, I teach their children. A lot of whom are, are men. Men who will assume their roles. I mean, how else can a woman give counsel or comfort to others? How else can they be used to bring people to Yeshua? How else can they live immediately in Messiah like? How else can they be blessed? How else can they be enriched? How else can that happen unless they learn the Torah? I want to share in conclusion a rabbinical drash from the sage Rashi on our Torah portion. 
And our Torah portion, as Vic had read for us, and I will read it again. He made the basin of bronze, with its base of bronze, from the mirrors of women, serving at the entrance to the tent of meeting. Okay? And this is the drosh by Rashi. Or at least snippets from it. The women of Israel had used these mirrors when beautifying themselves. Moshe initially rejected these mirrors for use in the Mishkan, arguing that they were a tool of the Yetzirah. The Yetzirah is the evil inclination. They were using them for vain purposes, fleshly purposes. But God overruled, the legend says, Moshe, and ordered him to accept them. God saying, these are more precious to me than anything else. And Rashi explains why these mirrors are so precious to God. When the Jews were enslaved in Egypt, the men had lost faith. They had given up hope. They did not want to live intimately any longer with their wives. They didn't want to have children. They didn't want to have children because the thought of fathering children who would be born into and live and die in slavery, slavery was overwhelmingly depressing. They didn't want their children to have to experience what they had experienced. That's one of the arguments for abortion today, by the way. Now, as the Midrash and Shur Hasharim describes, Song of Songs describes, the women went out into the fields and beautified themselves in front of their mirrors and convinced and persuaded their husbands to live with them and to have children. These mirrors represented Israel. Had it not been for these mirrors and that makeup and the beautification efforts of these women to make themselves attractive and desirable to the men who are very visual, there would not have been a Jewish nation. Consequently, God insisted that these precious mirrors did in fact belong in the Mishkan. He goes on to say that we see that those women exhibited the attribute of faith in redemption. When all seemed bleak and full of despair, when no future seemed to exist, when there appeared to be no purpose in having children, the women retained a hope for the future. The women kept the dream of birth and rebirth alive. When the men were feeling down and ready to give up, it was the women who insisted, we must go on. Rabbi Shogul says, let the women learn. Let the women learn. So that together, as men and women, we can understand and therefore be obedient to our unique roles as men and women. By learning Torah, ladies, you can be a redemptive witness, a mirror image of faithfulness that can enrich your family, empower the men in your life into their God-ordained purposes and roles, and thereby realizing your perfect God-ordained purpose. Please rise. Father, we often hold on to things. It's hard for us to let go. Ideas and beliefs and convictions. And so often things are misrepresented. Sometimes we think that the things that we have have value and worth. And in the end we find out that, that their value is empty. And a distortion of what we once thought was true. Father, when we walk with you, when your spirit is within us, your word takes us to a higher place, 
above, Father, to traditions of men and practices of the day, the fashions and the trends. You take us to the truth and you illuminate it for us, Father. And we carry that truth. It's not too heavy, but we carry it, Father, to others. We bear men what we are to bear, and ladies, you are to bear what you are to bear. We have different things that we carry, different things that we do, but all together in a unique and equal purpose. We share in the blessings, we share, Lord, in the consequences. But nevertheless, Father, we all share in Messiah. Yes, we are men and women, we are one in Messiah but uniquely and wonderfully made. Amen. So Father, in Yeshua's name, help us to re-identify in our lives what our unique purposes are within the kehilat, within the body, the congregation, within our marriages, within our communities, and the workers, no matter what, Father. Let's be mindful of the unique way that you made each of us and how we both can serve together for the higher calling and purpose of the Son. We pray these things in Yeshua's name, the congregation says. Amen. Give Rech Yahweh Vaish Marecha Sadonai Paravalecha Vichanecha Sadonai Paravalecha Vilsim Lecha bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. And I pray the Lord will lift his counts upon you and grant you his shalom, his peace, and the congregation agrees. Amen. Amen.